this is the guru nanak which we are you know we look at his portraits these days which is really not the real guru nanak why what why well he he's a farmer would a farmer look like that that's a very different image we have made i mean his hands would be fair and lovely hands you look at the farmer's hands they will be very different the government in 84 had hired a company to do a negative campaign on six globally it's called rediffusion which became rediff mail eventually as in the same company became rediff yeah rediff mail eventually rediff.com yeah story of guru gobind singh even six are not ready for we actually don't know guru gobind singh is what i say to six what do we know about him you know if i say to you he was a bihari most people will be like what he's a bihari he's not punjabi he's born in patna today's episode is immensely powerful immensely storytelling oriented and immensely informative if you've ever wanted to learn about sikhi which most people know of as sikhism this is the episode we did a prequel episode about guru nanak and the basics of sikhi this one is more of a deep dive if you're sick of course watch this one till the end spread it as much as possible but if you're indian in general even if you're not sick this is the episode you need to watch to understand the historical sikh perspective and the present sikh perspective considering that this whole khalistan situation has woken up in the world lately this is the podcast that people need to watch all i'll request of you is to share this episode as far and as wide as possible for more episodes just like this make sure you follow us on spotify we're spotify exclusive every episode's available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world on today's episode harinder singh returns to educate us to enlighten us and to take us through the journey of sikhi on trs Arvindar Singh, so welcome back to the Ranveer Show for an even deeper conversation on Sikhi. No, careful with what you ask for, man. Sometimes <laughs> deeper gets. Yeah, it smells too. Then <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> This is the sequel to last time's episode, sir. Um, I really thought we'll end up doing a story to actually begin talking about uh, Sikhi on TRS. Hmm. Uh, we didn't do that. We actually spoke about the philosophies of it more. Uh, I think we ended the last episode with Guru Nanak Dev Ji's learnings. Hmm. What the absolute core principles uh, of Sikhs are. I actually want to begin this episode by going back to the story a little bit, hmm. and then again we follow the same pattern where we go tangentially. So we were talking about Kartarpur mm -hmm. in the last one, yeah, and we were talking about succession. Hmm. Okay, on this episode we also have to address the Guru Granth Sahib in detail. Yes. Uh, Which one would you like to begin at? The succession. Wherever you want to go. Where would you like to go? <laughs> It's your show. It's for your audience. Let's go with the succession. Sounds good. So at Kartarpur, he's training, right? He's training in this paradigm of what I was calling a kovankar, and then we talked about it. But the words which come out more is, as I was saying, there's a city now. There's a planning. How are you going to institutionalize certain things? Which means, what is the policy of this area? how do we live essentially today we call this governance today we call this community building right so what is guru angad given the next in line before guru nanak leaves this earth so this is very important this all happened when he is alive so it didn't happen after he died first of all and it's not his son so what did he give him this is directly from guru granth sahib so things i want to talk about is how do i know all this because what guru granth sahib the the world calls it the sikh scripture scripture is not the right word for it in my opinion because that's of native it's not a native term we call it bani bani is a voice which voice is being carried in there right the voice which guru nanak is carrying in this is he says what was given to guru angad that what was his qualification he says he was given the divine qualities dagun so this is very very important so what did he transfer he says he because he was possessing the divine qualities he's been trained in it guru nanak personally trained him when he gave him the guruship he gave him gyan khadag gyan is not just a knowledge it is that deeper knowledge which we call wisdom with a capital w now right 
And then kharag is a symbolism of the ability to rule. Kharag is sword. That it is authoritative ability. This is the Guru Nanak, which we are, you know, we look at his portraits these days, which is really not the real Guru Nanak. Why? What? Why? Well, he, he's a farmer. Would a farmer look like that? That's a very different image we have made. I mean, his hands would be fair and lovely hands. You look at the farmer's hands, they will be very different. So we have created this Sant tradition Guru Nanak, whereas mm. the real Guru Nanak is a traveler. The real Guru Nanak is spending time in jail. The real Guru Nanak is farming. The real Guru Nanak is wearing different clothes and eating different things and talking in different languages. That's a different Guru Nanak, which is the real Guru Nanak in Guru Granth Sahib, our source of truth. And I was saying it's not a scripture because it's more like a charter. You have to read the charter and interpret it. It is not a mantra to be repeated only. Expand a little bit on what a charter means. Sir. Charter means what are your first principles? Because first principles don't talk about every issues. You have to use those. It's like a constitution to interpret for the reality of today. So like in 2023, if I have a behavioral thing going on, a political scenario or economic issue, what is a solution from this paradigm? So that's a charter. Charters don't cover every issue. They cover the principles which have to be interpreted for your reality in the era you are living in. Okay. So universal rules that actually go past timelines. That's right. Beyond the space of time and era you are in. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So that's what Guru Anga is getting. So he institutionalizes what? Like Guru Nanak travel, set up the city. The two major things he did, he develops a new script. Like Gurmukhi's script is not, a, it's Guru, Guru Granth Sahib is not Punjabi. Punjabi existed before Guru Nanak. Punjab is a region. Languages are local phenomena. But he develops a script. Now, this is something which people don't understand. Development of a new script in everywhere in the world is considered development of a new political unit. Really? Absolutely. Because this is how the knowledges are going to be written and transferred. So Guru Nanak utilizes all the letters of Gurmukhi script, but Guru Angad organizes them and he becomes a teacher because he says now knowledge has to be availed, what we call today availed to the whole open source <laughs> of knowledge because mm. it was not open source. Mm. It was very much of a privilege. So Guru Angad develops it and he's teaching you earlier in the last show we talked about Sher Suri. He comes one day to see Guru Angad. This is going to really? be interesting because, and he's quite upset Himayu comes to see him. A day after, he loses to Sher Sasuri. Yeah. Small context, uh, Babar was the first Mughal emperor. Babar's son was Humayu. He's the second Mughal emperor. Who got ousted by Sher Shah Suri, who That's... was Babar's general, I believe. He, worked, he was in Babar's army. For he something. becomes his adversary at some point. That's right. Yeah. And then uh, Sher Shah Suri is power hungry, actually becomes a powerful emperor. But then I don't think he has a good successor. Something like that. Okay. Because you see, history is eventually his story, right? <laughs> so All it right. depends on which version we go by. But we'll say they're adversaries. I, I don't like to say that it is only that because okay. emperor is a strong word. Mm. you know. Uh, okay. But he's an adversary, yes. Eventually, Humayu gets the throne back. for the That's Mughals. right. right. And Humayu, in that condition, when he has just lost, actually comes to Guru Angad in a city which he founded called Kadur. It still exists. It's near Amritsar, Kadur Sahib, we call it. And he's teaching that day, Guru Angad, in, uh, near Amritsar on Indian side. That's okay. right. All, uh, the cities are on both sides of the border because it was Punjab. Huh? Um, and he's teaching that day. And Himayu walks in and he gets stopped. He's very upset because, you know, he's a big man. It's like a prime minister walking in and you're not attending to him. He's like, look. And he pulls out his sword. And Guru Angad, he's like, you didn't pull it where you needed to pull it. I'm teaching right now. Just wait. So this level of instruction and communication with emperor and again emperor is another thing. This is part of the Gyan Kharag. The ability to have a conversation and say the truth where you need to say it. That's what Guru is. Guru word, you know, it's a principally speaking. Uh, if you look in, in the Hindustani parampara, as they say in the tradition, it means Gu is darkness and Ru is light. Somebody who is an enlightener, who takes you from the ignorance to enlightenment including with the emperors. 
So that's Guru Angad's confrontation as well. So every Guru of the 10 Gurus, if you look at it like this from Guru Nanak, Guru Angad, and eventually to Guru Gobind Singh, it's the same jyot, the same light. The only thing which is, and it's in fact the Sikh uh, paradigm in Guru Granth Sahib says, the light was exactly the same, which means wisdom, and method was exactly the same. Now, this might confuse people because we have our own image of what Guru Gobind Singh is and what Guru Nanak is. It says, Jyot Oha Jugat Sai. Jugat is method, how they implemented the vision. Only thing different between the 10 bodies was the body. Kaya change hui yasarif. What was the method? Exactly. So method is what, how Guru Nanak did dialogue, how Guru Nanak developed institutions, Guru Angad further did, which means the external manifestation changes. Like some people believe the first five gurus uh, were pacifist. This is what books write. And then they write that next four became a little militant and Guru Gobind Singh became very militant. Yeah. This is a common thesis, completely antithetical to Sikh belief. Which is? That all guru was exactly the same. Militancy, uh, physical fight, you know, like wars, is an external manifestation of what's needed at the time. But every single one was prepared. The whole symbolism in Guru Granth Sahib is they all carried Gyan and they all carried Kharag. Mm. Uh, so we have to understand that. Uh, this is why nothing changed from Guru Nanak to Guru Gobind Singh. It's the, uh, it's the acclimatization of the time, the needs of the time. You're being shown how to work with it, okay. how to tackle it or address it. Okay. At the start of the last episode, we spoke about the mystical aspects of mm. six. Uh, would you like to highlight it here as well, especially when we're talking about a wisdom transfer? Absolutely. Uh, the mystical element, so even the very names, I, I like to work with the words themselves, right? So Guru Angad is named Lena. Lena is an asset, literally, that's what it means. And he is so well trained. What is the training in? In the wisdom and the methodology, Jyot and the Jugat. That eventually when he's given the Guruship, he's called Angad that Guru Nanak is saying, you are of my own body now. So body otherwise is different. So mysticism is what? Mysticism is you can physically understand that this is the next body, but the ability to have the same relationship with the divine, and then within that, out of that relationship, your ability to rule or create methods or the solutions for the community. That's the mystical element. Guru Angad has his own experience of the divine. That's the whole point. And those experiences we can all have, and Guru Angad also had, who otherwise, by the way, earlier did all sorts of things too. This is another thing I want to mention. People think they were perfect beings. No. They were average Joes, as we call them today. You know, they also had trajectories of life which took them all sorts of places. But once they entered into the house of wisdom, in this case, the house of Guru Nanak, they consciously chose to change their lifestyle. And then they got trained in it. Then they experienced it. And among from those, one led it. And Guru Angad is that. Okay. Uh, want to expand on his journey? He, uh, one of them I mentioned was the, uh, the development of the uh, script, which people, it's, it's education. Effect of that I want to mention is, you know, in the early 20th century, we don't know this, what people now call Golden Temple. Uh, the Harmandar Sahib complex, there's a parkarma, there's a, you walk around it, right? You know, on where there's a wide walkway, there used to be classes there. Our Gurdwaras used to be learning centers. Now they've become worship centers. They used to be where there was uh, activism. You see some of that, but you see it in a very different way these days. You know, it's more flashy. So this was a place where, and this is what gurus developed, that look, the learning, first one was spiritual center, your connection to the divine. We use the word Simran, that we learn how to be in the remembrance of the one. That's the first reason why we go to Gurdwara. And the next four, there are four more. Eventual one is that it's a fort, but things which need to be protected, you provide protection, whether it's human and primarily it's human beings. That's why Gurdwaras used to be safe sanctuaries what we now call sanctuary cities in America, when the president of America is messing things up, there were few mayors who said, no, come to our cities, we'll protect you. That's what Gurdwaras used to be, mm -hmm. including during emergency. I don't know many people know this in India, when there was a period of emergency in mid 70s in this country, 1970s, people of opposition 
went to Darbar Sahib complex in Amritsar and they were in sanctuary there. No police or no army went there, knowing very well that even the current Prime Minister of India was inside. So this is a very big thing, creating Gurdwara as a safe space where uh, empowerment center for women, Guru Anga did that as well. So what I'm trying to say is the ideas in Guru Granth Sahib are really about becoming a lover of the divine. I'm going to come back to that sure. because they write it as such. They use that word. In fact, I should share that. It says, you know, people talk about who's a lover and we got our own versions of from Bollywood to mysticisms to old guzzles. In Guru Granth Sahib, it says, people who make lists of pluses and minuses, they can never be called lovers because lovers live beyond consequences. So think about that for a second. Mostly we are dealing with transactionality, we call it today. The transactions of life, including in the relationships. We have done exactly the same when we pursue divinity. You know, human behavior is, I'll do this prashad or I'll do that if this happens. That's transaction. What we are told is, no, the lover just loves. It is up to the beloved what the beloved does. So this angle is carried by each guru. But uh, as a relationship, because they became the lovers, the ultimate lovers, we must be addressing the realities of the communities we live in. This is why you see such a political activism among Sikhs from day one. That's in the DNA because Guru Nanak did it. Mm. Because people don't understand why Sikhs are like this. Well, because that's what we believe in. And we do this to our own leaders. We don't look at whether he's Hindu or a Sikh or a Muslim. We did that to Ranjit Singh too. Because it's part of jurrat jo sikhaiya from Guru Nanak onward, ability to speak the truth when it's needed, not afterwards. And he writes it like that. Guru Nanak has written a Shabbat where he says, such so nice is such ki vela. Make sure, make sure you speak the truth where it is needed the most at that moment. So that becomes part of a DNA. These are the trainings. So this idea of physical and non-physical or metaphysical, if you want to call it, if you want to be philosophical about it, this is part of the training. And that training idea is in Guru Granth Sahib. We call it Shabad. Shabad is an old Indian Indology word, you know, where it, it's a combination of word and sound. And what has happened over the years, this is my understanding now, that the knowledge part people are still pursuing. Sound part is the experience part. And because we lack that experience, the wisdom is becoming something else. It is some intellectualization, you know, like PhD job security stuff going on rather than experience and the knowledge coming together to bring changes within and for the communities we live in. Said a lot of deep stuff in this one paragraph. <laughs> well, you said you wanted something deep. In yeah, this no, one. <laughs> no, no, this is great. This is great. Consensus of what you're saying is again, that element of mysticism and dhyan especially, hmm. when it comes back uh, into the younger generation of Sikhs, people will know true Sikhism. That's what I've understood from what you're saying. Something like that. And I don't want to reduce this to six. You okay. know, I went to a space in Lahore on a Friday at 7 p.m. I was speaking at Punjabi University of Lahore. You know, there's a Punjabi University in Indian side. There's one there because of 47. And I finished my lecture and I realized it was 7 p.m. And there is, I went to this Sangat. They call it Sangat. Muslim leftist Sufis stood together there. I'd read about them in a book. Sayyid Najam Hussain. And I went there and that day. They were discussing Pai Gurdas's Vara, who was an exponent of uh, a theologian and a linguist from the fifth Guru's period, the one who was a scribe of Guru Granth Sahib. Just like on this side of the border, that side, these borders are, you know, fictitious, as we said, they're constructed. People, it's not just the Sikhs who read these. This was part of the culture of Punjab. Mm. It was Sikhs, non-Sikhs, Muslims, tribals, Hindus, Sufis, leftist Sufis included. You know, so my point in sharing this is it's not just the Sikhs. Obviously, the one who claims to be of the Guru, they better understand it. But others also read this. And I don't like to say true Sikhi because as soon as we start qualifying, something has to be negated then. And this is where the wars are, right? The debates on ideas is this. Everyone's claiming they are true. Well, the truth is in the source of truth, which for Sikhs is Guru Granth Sahib. Everything else is debatable. Bit of a rookie question. Yeah. Um, 
was the Guru Granth Sahib constantly added upon over the years? Because that's the narrative that a lot of Indians have. Yeah. What's the narrative? Guru Granth Sahib was compiled by Guru Arjan, the fifth in the line of the Gurus. Okay. He, every Guru got the Banis, like Guru Nanak's Bani, Guru Angad's Bani, Guru Amar Das, Guru Ram Das, and Guru Arjan is there. And by now, there's a fifth generation of six. By Bani, you mean learnings of the time, of their They time. are compiled in Shabads, poetry and rag. Okay. Remember, we are too focused on intellectual element, the literary element. But the poetry and rag is very important, the musical harmony and the poetics, because that's where many things are experienced mystically. You're saying once you chant, what's written in Sing. the book? Sikh culture is primarily about singing. Gao. Look, right now there are two of us talking, we are exchanging, but we are not talking at the same time. If we talk at the same time, nothing will be understood. If we change that to singing, and you can make a thousand people, it will be a powerful experience. But if a thousand people were talking, it will be a pretty destructive experience. Sikhi, it's very much kirtan and singing. Gao. Because when we sing, we are invoking in the Indologies what we call ras, shingars, or the flavors, emotions, which brings to us a larger experience of our understanding. So Sikh culture is very much about singing. And not in the way we see it these days, it's become something else. You know, Ramindranath Tagore went to the Varsav complex and he heard there, and he, he's written about this. He's like, this is a very different music. And he just wanted to keep listening to it. He's never heard anything like it. Until 1970s, the Bollywood directors used to go to Darbar Sahib complex to listen to the newest thing, which means the tradition was that rich, you know, of Kirtan, not this regular Kirtan with a three key magic business. So that's where it's coming from because every guru sang, they played the instruments. Can I have a go at this, like in terms of reverse engineering the logic a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, when you watch a movie, the background score plays a huge role. If it, if there's the same scene with the music for a thriller moment, uh -huh. that'll make you feel different. And yeah. if the same scene has romantic music, that'll make you feel different. That's right. So what I am assuming is that the words in the Guru Granth Sahib had power and that, that power was added upon more by tune because tune made you feel a certain way as a chanter. And that mixture of the words as well as the emotions, as well as the tune actually resulted in a deeper connection to the divine, which was Guru Nanak's original idea. Something like that. Okay. You, you, it's something like that. In fact, if I may use a phrase, when Guru Nanak would start to sing, when he'll say Mardanya, who was his companion, who played Rabab, yeah? one of the string instruments. And he would say, Bani aaiya, Rabab ched. Look at the word ched. You don't play. It's what we call, you know, when you are just mess around. Musti. Mm. Mess around with it's the... not even, it's like when you're having a jamming session. Mm. I, I don't want to use word. So chedna, you know, it's got other elements in there. There's a lot of connotation in, it's not you're going to play me. You're going to touch me in a particular way that is going to do certain things. Mm. Right? There is that feeling element, passionate element in there. So yeah, the music does that. And playing a particular music, you know, the, I mean, I can get into that. The old Hindustani tradition of <laughs> Margi Sangeet, as they call it, uh, used to be all about singing Drupad, which barely two or three exponents are left now. What is Drupad? <laughs> exactly, right? Because now we don't get to hear it. And then we wonder how come the facts not because Every music has its own, not just genre, but emotion. Uh, there's a purpose of invoking it. Mm. Right? Okay. Like if I'm listening to Public Enemy, I know <laughs> what I'm going to get from Chuck D. Mm. If I'm listening to Phil Collins, I know what I'm going to get. But if I'm listening to Dagger Brothers, I know what I'm going to get. If I'm listening to Bhim San Joshi, I know I'm going to get incredible techniques. If I'm listening to Bade Gulam Ali Khan Sahib, I know how he's going to make me cry, right? So there's a, there's an invocation. Mm. So Drupad had something of that nature, which now has become rare. You know, now even the Dhamars we hear have become something else now. Dhamar was incredible because 
they invoke the emotion where the whole vibrations, as we call them now, thar thar hard hai na jo. now it's semi-romantic, if I may call it that. Earlier it used to be romance, but a much more fulfilling one and transcending it to divine romance. Mm. Okay. Now I'll have to pull you back to the story, sir. Uh, that's kind of an anchor through these two episodes. What would you like to say about Guru Angad's life? So we were on Guru Arjan, right? How Guru Granth Sahib came? What are different versions? Do, do you want to skip the third and fourth Gurus? No, no. I mean, we can get into it, but I can combine it in here. Okay, sure. So the way Guru Granth Sahib came, as we were talking about, it's collection. What Guru Nanak gave to Guru Angad, they gave him Bani. They gave him Gyan and Khadag, remember? Methodology and wisdom. And wisdom is in the Bani. Bani is the voice, which is a collection of Shabads, you know. So that was given to Guru Angad. Guru Angad gave to Guru Amar Das. Guru Amar Das gave to Guru Ram Das. And Guru Ram Das, by that time, Guru Arjan came. He's 18 years old. Of course, we can discuss everything, but I want to mention 18 year old. He has two elder brothers who don't get the Guruship. You can see what it does in, even in today's scenario in Hindustan Parampara, right? One is a renunciate, the other collaborates with the state of the time too much. He's 18 year old. He's the one who looks at that now distortion is occurring. People are writing Shabbos, they add the word Nanak in there. It happens even today. Mm. He's like, how are we going to know what is the source of truth? So he designs an ingenious system of compiling this. He's, Guru Arjan is the one then who put together what we now call Guru Granth Sahib. There are only two versions. First is his. Everything available to him till his Bani, all the, what I called earlier, the radical Pagats, 15 of them, bards, you know, they're called Pat, the court poets in the courts of the Gurus, 11 of them, and then three Sikhs who recorded certain things in the Guru period. He takes all of them and compiles them and it was called Ad Granth at the time. And then the second version is what Guru Gobind Singh put together, uh, which includes the Banis of the ninth Guru, Guru Tegh Bahadur. So there are only two. The rest is all confusion. Okay. And there are only two authenticated first by Guru Arjun, that this is the only authentic. Are there alternative ones? Absolutely. The descendants who are biological descendants who didn't get the Guruship, they like to claim their other ones. Mm. But they have never been accepted by six because we believe what Guru said is the right one. And we only focus on that. Okay. I want you to paint a bit of a historical, contextual picture of the time. I'm assuming that at the time of the second, third, fourth and fifth Guru, we're talking also about the time the Mughal Empire was growing and ruling Hindustan. Absolutely. So uh, the third Guru is the Akbar's time. Third and fourth Guru. So the ages are different because third Guru is very old as well. In fact, He's the oldest guru from an age. They're all destroying stereotypes, as I said earlier, right? And one of the stereotypes he destroys is in his 60s, he changes his lifestyle. And he eventually gets the guruship. There are many other people because the criteria is same. The people who have become like the divine in their behaviors, not just in their vocalizations, right? He's the one who organized the six in 22 manjis, it's called, because the Mughal Empire at the time had 22 regions. And this may shock people. Three of the heads of those missions, as we call them today, were women. The oldest man as a guru, because old people don't change their habits, that's why I'm saying this, he actually appoints the head of Kabul mission, the Kabul Manji, as a woman. And you know how women in Afghanistan even today are treated. This is mandate. You don't say they're equal. You don't say we should do that. Should is preaching. You just do it. And you do it that if you want to talk to me, she's my emissary, you better talk to her. Mm. Figure out how to talk to her. You may not agree with it, but she's our emissary. You better figure out how to talk to her. Mm. That's what Guru Amar Das did. So Guru Arjan, the one who brought together, by the way, the fourth guru is the poorest guru. Third guru was the richest guru. The fourth guru, you're from Amritsar, I just learned. Maybe you recall sometimes, you know, they gave you other than Prashad, chole hote hain saath mein. Mm. That's in the memory of Guru Ram Das, because as a kid, he was a very poor kid. He used to sell those to make his living. Now think about this. The richest guru is marrying his daughter to somebody who's that poor, because the criteria was not how rich somebody is in terms of wealth or money assets. 
the richness of qualities. Mm. This is how stereotypes are being destroyed. That's why among six, a um, lot of this principally is very clear. In practice, people are not able to do it many a time. Can you give a little historical context on how uh, the belief system was spreading? Like what yeah. was happening, uh, especially with respect to the Mughal Empire, as well as the local kings of the time. I'm sure there was some kind of religious debates, mm. religious persecution of some form. Uh, from both sides, by the way, from the predecessor, for example, the Hindu and Islamic ideas, the both culture, the Muslim ideas, the religious leaders are not very happy with the gurus because there's a lot of disruption. The Qazis and the Brahmins are not happy because you're treating way beyond the ideas of equality of the time, mm. right? From a caste perspective, from the women perspective. I mean, it's, it's, it's very dis... When anyone's power is being taken away, it's a hegemonic culture is being destroyed. Mm. That's what we call it today. Mm. And that's why there are issues. So there were issues. I mean, six out of the 10 gurus, just to put a number on it, to make it so clear, and because we don't understand these things, six out of the 10 gurus either spent time in jail, they were targets of political assassination or martyred with torture. Guru Arjun, we just talked about, right? Who, his two biggest contributions are Guru Granth Sahib and uh, what we call Golden Temple today, Harmandar Sahib Complex. From, because one disrupted the thought that it's available to everyone. He wrote that. He says, all the wisdom I had gathered, I'm openly presenting to the world. Pyo Dade Da Khol Ditha Khajana. Pyo Dada are ancestral. Ancestor here are not biological. They are guruships, the ones who carried the wisdom. He's like, I am openly now making it available to everyone. Obviously, the, the Muslim and the Hindu priest didn't like that, or the Qazis. It wasn't open previously? No. It was Because remember, for... even today, religiosity is so exclusive. People say it can only be given to particular people in a particular way at a particular time. So anyone who took up Sikhi, it was presented. And non six. No, I mean before uh, Guru Arjun. Nee, Guru Nanak is already doing it. Now, look, the Guru Nanak traveled and the Shabad was available. So, one of the things, this is a great question. In Sikhi, the personality is not central, Shabad is. We appreciate Guru Nanak and call him honorifically Guru Nanak. But according to Guru Nanak himself, the Guru is always the Sabad. What we call Shabad now used to be Sabad, you know, old language. The word. The wisdom itself, the okay. eternal wisdom. So that became, that has always been central in Sikhi. That's why you'll see Guru Granth Sahib, the reverence Sikhs give is at a very next level. It is not just a religious book for us. Mm. Because we believe that's central to us. And not just us, to the world. The wisdom is central. And Guru Arjun, because he created a center to house that wisdom too, that's a golden temple complex. Now the, and everyone's allowed. So people in Asia were not used to that. Anyone can come and have access to it. Mm. These two were the reasons why he was tortured to death. Want to talk about that? I want to just address the golden temple first. Okay. Uh, that is the image of Sikhi for a lot of people all over the world. I won't just say Indians. Oh, it's global image. Yes. Um, foreign... 11 year old watching this show, how would you explain its significance? Great. This is. Firstly, I'm going to take out the word golden. In the guru period of the 10 gurus, it was never golden. Maharaja Ranjit Singh made it golden. So, you know, the glitter part was never part of the Sikh tradition. It became when they became rulers. Mm. Ranjit Singh was a Maharaja of Punjab, right? Which has its own right. It's a great story. But in the Guru period, it was never golden. It is, architecture is very, very important. Four doors, which means open to all four people from all four corners. Doesn't matter which caste, which background, which religion. And anyone who comes, he has to walk down. There is only way to enter a shrine is being humble. Going down is that. And doesn't matter which entrance you came in from, there's only way, one way to go to divinity. So surrounding the pool, the, the Sarovar, as we call it, there's only one pathway which goes to Harimandar Sahab. Harimandar. Hari, in Indic tradition, including in Sikh tradition, is the 
word which is hari can mean all pervasive i'm i'm going to go to etymology now sure hari means all pervasive hari is not just a vishnu's avatar that's the name many like my name is hari and that doesn't mean i'm what does the word mean it's the most oft repeated word in guru granth sahib that's why it's called hari mandar anything which is physical will be something less so what is the idea first right it's a building at the end of the day but what's the idea behind the building so when you see it idea behind the building is here is one manifestation of all pervasive force that's what hari means hari also means the one who eliminates your fear so if you want to eliminate fear let's read what's housed in this building right which is what i talked about earlier hari so hari is something green something which grows you something which blossoms and our ideas for that are housed here in this building in harmandar sahib complex that's what should be coming out right now it's become a selfie thing which i get it because of the glitter and everyone respected it that's why even when they tortured guru arjan to death they dare not attack it or dare not say it take out guru granth sahib because it is includes elements of uh baba farid who comes from islamic tradition and this is this is very disruptive Just let me put it blanketly where people understand it has shabads of brahman it also has shabads of butcher think about that for a second this is how disruptive it was people didn't know how to deal because they're like it doesn't matter what your background is if you have experience ikko vankar the one then we must learn from them doesn't matter what they wear doesn't matter what they eat doesn't matter what religion they come from doesn't matter what language is utilized by them it's the experience we identify because that experience is so intimate so personal so divine that's guru granth sahib house in harbandar sahib complex okay and for people who've not been there would you like to relay something about what you experienced there well it's it's emotional experience for most people who visit there um doesn't matter what background they are for many it's a historical thing because the history of that complex is very unique not just the construction and what i just talked about the idea but throughout history it's been destroyed many times as well um and it's rebuilt many times as well in fact there is a sikh author from delhi you know who's died now sadar patwan singh i'm going to quote him he he did a book on golden temple with raghu rai a celebrated photographer of india so i'm just giving that reference if people want to check it out and he has written this phrase here about what this place is and the phrase he used is it took the blood and sweat of many generations to build it to defend it and to rebuild it it is not a sacred place for us we don't have a sikhi doesn't have a idea of sacred space we believe every place is sacred it's a historical place where we gather and we learn that vision and implement that vision so when you look at that visual sometimes you don't know what to do politically speaking that's what this place is it's that complex which has multiple gurdwaras actually you know you've probably seen there a couple of long watch towers there used to be hundreds of them until the early 20th century because everyone every group thought the sikh groups included we should play our role to protect this area it's that good yeah they were called bungas the watch towers not of the government not of the sikhs of people from various biradaris or groups who said we want to play a role in protecting it's so good the wisdom in there um yeah i think the context i gained is that it's a historical symbol Uh, not symbol symbols are transferable so i have to be careful with the words you can say draw it on a piece of paper put it in your pocket that's a symbol it's a manifestation of that idea which is living reality this is why you know there was a move to make the golden temple complex a unesco site many sikhs who understand this vehemently opposed it unesco sites are not lived realities they are in the past they are being just protected this is a lived functional space Mm. it must be understood as such 
It is part of the Sikh DNA that don't tell us what to do with it. We have never listened to anyone who's told us. None of the gurus did. This is our space. We will do what we need to do here. What do you mean never listen to anyone who has told you? Why Why would someone tell the Sikhs? <laughs> anyone who, including, uh, look, um, because Sikhs DNA, I said, is like a spiritual political DNA. Mm. And spiritual and political leaders always want to be controlling whether they look like six or whether they don't look like six. Okay, so okay. they want to control the thought process which is emanated from there. Mm, because it's opposition for them technically. That's right. Like in the British period, uh, people don't know, like, you know, the, the Sikh activism in early 20th century was even the Gurdwaras were run by British. Okay. Yes. They assigned managers at each Gurdwara because they knew, the, including their Warsaw complex, Golden Temple complex. This is going to shock you. They had their own Jathedar who actually brought General Dwyer, the guy who gave orders for Jallianwala attack and gave him Saropa, which means acknowledged him, yeah? recognized him. Can you imagine that? Because it was appointed by the British. So six decided in the early 20th century, we're going to free our Gurdwaras. This will be your test run on how to free South Asia. And they did. They got ground Golden Temple Complex back. They got Nankana Sa, where Guru Nanak was born back. And once they freed enough Gurdwaras, it's actually called Gurdwara uh, Reform Movement, which means taking the Gurdwaras back into Sikh control instead of the government control. Uh, that's when Gandhi, you know, that thing which you may not know, he went to Nankana Sa and he sent a telegram. The first battle of Indian independence has been won because no native, anywhere in South Asia was able to free their places. Then came the political movement from Punjab. If you look at the statistics of Indian independence, uh, people who died, people who were sent to life imprisonment, Kalapani Kisaja as they call it, people who were hanged, 60% hanged or six, 2% of the population. This is the DNA. 80% of the people sent to life imprisonment, Andaman, Nicobar or Singapore, six. So this is where political activism is born from Shabal. You can paint whatever picture you want. We are listening to our ideology from the Guru, which believes in freeing things. So, so first they freed the Gurdwaras, then they worked towards, so whether you were Bhagat Singhs of the time, whether you were Randhir Singhs of the time, and Bhagat Singh otherwise said, I'm an atheist. But you know, if you read his articles, he says everything I've learned is from a grandfather. And these Babbar Akalis, who are fighting right now and hanged by the British, it is according to because of what they have done. And it was during Holi, so let me invoke it. You know, Holi is coming, right, right now? On the Holi day, Bhagat Singh wrote this editorial in the Hindi paper. If India ever becomes free, it will be because what Babbar Akalis are doing in Punjab fighting the British, and he writes that editorial. So this is, what I'm saying is early 20th century. This is not far distant. We don't even tell these narratives right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, which is why, honestly, there is a change in the internet narrative where uh, a lot of young Indians are feeling a lot of gratitude towards the Sikh community yeah. for the protection, honestly, that the Sikh community has given the rest of India and for the sense of warriorship. I don't know if I'm finding the right words, honestly, yeah. but I know that the emotion was conveyed. But so, there is a narrative like this. So I, I must admit that you know, I left as a very young man. I'm going to give a personal angle to this sure. now because you just invoked a feeling, right? And a memory. 84 happened. I was here. I was 11 and a half years old. And I remember what happened in Jhansi and what happened in Punjab because I was actually in Punjab during June and November. I was, this is when attack on Golden Temple and genocidal campaign, which now Indian courts have finally accepted, including a Delhi court. I was a very angry young man. At 12, you remember everything. I remember who protected us too. You know, I'm here sitting here because not my next door neighbor, but the guy sit, who lived his third house down, Bhagwan Das, because he took us into his house. I would have been dead that day. You know, mob mentalities, many things happen, right? I'm sorry, I'm cutting you. Feel free to like share the experience. Just so there's a lot of young listeners, give them context. So... Things happened in 84, there's a reaction from the government and the people. I, I don't, I'll share this part, right? So I am a younger young man and I have a perspective on what has happened. I don't know what to do with it. 
In fact, for the next 10 years, you know, when I left this country, I said, I'm never going to come back. I could have been that guy who picks up the AK-47. I mean, that's the honest truth. I was very angry as to what had happened. At the same time, when I came back here, like I came back, I think in 96 or 97, after going through my engineering and learning, dealing with my own trauma, I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in education. I got to channelize this anger. You know, I have to deal with the conscience of what has happened, of Indian conscience, because my friends are Hindus too. It's not about a Hindu Sikh thing. That's the narrative which plays out. It's not. It really is a government thing, and Sikh DNA thinks like that from Guru Nanak period onward. It doesn't matter who's at the center or the power centers is what I mean. And, you know, when I came back, I'll just share that. I had no reason to go back to Jhansi. I landed in Delhi in 96 because I wanted to go study about ling languages of Guru Granth Sahib. But I took the train, I went to Jhansi for a day to meet Bhagwan Das. Because I know I'm alive because of him. I know what they did to him next day in the market. People were not very happy with him that he protected us. But that's a human issue, right? What I'm sharing with you is that it took me 10 plus years just to think about what to do with this. You know, you have to channelize your angers. And then I realized, look, hatred is never the thing. We talk about this, but it's, you go through your own journey of it. I didn't hate India or Hindus. In fact, sometimes people ask me, you know, do you hate India? I'm like, no, how can I do that? I don't think any Sikh can. There's no such thing. But you must understand what has happened and how there hasn't been a reparation. There hasn't been a discourse on how to correct it. And any psychologist will tell you, even when you lose in a breakup, in a bad breakup between, you know, even as a girlfriend, boyfriend, and if it's an ugly breakup, a violent one, you need help. You know, it must be addressed. So that addressing kind of consciousness hasn't happened, but sick narrative believes in that. Sick narrative is never about vengeance. No guru, Guru Granth Sahib doesn't even have the word badla. I know some Sikhs use it, but it's because they're angry. But Guru Granth Sahib's language has the word justice in it, naya. And that's why Sikhs are very big on it every time. Doesn't matter which country they live in, they'll become politically active because they read Bani and Bani says, connect with the divine, always fight for justice. In America, I'm, I'm just connecting the dot. You know, the, the f 100 years ago in America, there's a Sikh man who goes all the way to Supreme Court three times, US Supreme Court, fighting to be recognized as a citizen of America. Bhagat Singh Thind is his name. He was a soldier and a spiritualist who wrote books on things. He went to represent America as a soldier. Even there, people said things you like, no, I should be a citizen. How come only whites are allowed to vote? So that's in the DNA. The DNA comes from Shabad, Guru Granth Sahib, and it, it asks us to fight for justice, regardless of the circumstances. And I like to say, justice is not just us. This is why Sikhs don't have an issue doing that for others. That's how we are trained. That's how we are trained. But when you're fighting your own battles and reparation hasn't happened internally, then, then you become small, so you talk about smaller things. And I think my community is going through some of that because that, that addressing, there is a whole battle of trauma and memory, and it is going on. I think it is addressing some of it, but... It, it needs a larger conversation to be addressed. Would you like to have the larger conversation right now a little bit? Because this is a youth-oriented show. Sure. And people are all yours, honestly. There are good and bad people in every faith. Oh, I, I, I subscribe to that. Yeah. I'm interested in, you know, the worst of the people. Yeah. They also have a conscience, man. It's how we approach. Oh. In the right circumstances, in the right conversation, things can be... Powerful. Yeah. Uh, I'd actually like to know. And I don't think I've met a Sikh who's as uh, capable as you are in terms of speaking up for the community because of your understanding of the faith, of the history. And I know that you have knowledge about multiple subjects. It's also why I'm asking you that what is the uh, word of the Sikh community right now? In terms of you're saying there's unaddressed things, I'd actually like to know what uh, you feel is unaddressed on a public platform like this. Sure. 
Sikh community, you know, the, we can't go back too far, but let's say since 47, there have been issues. There were promises made by Congress, all Indian National Congress, not the Congress party of today, which represented India. They never got fulfilled. People don't realize, I didn't know these things. Look, I grew up writing, you know, father of the nation essays, just like anyone else in this country. And it is my formative years in college when I'm dealing with my own learning and getting rid of my anger, but channelizing into, I realize what are the issues, you know? And there are actual unaddressed issues. Even yesterday, I'll be honest, you know, I was a new, sitting in a plane, I picked up a newspaper, scanning through it, and I'm looking, reading a column, Swami Onyx, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of it. It's calling for people like APS Gal and Bayad Singh to be brought back to Punjab. I'm like, seriously? Those were serious human rights violations from every angle. You so, ha you'll have to give a little context to all Sure, I'm saying, so Punjab went through militancy period. And during militancy, there were several human rights con violations. They're unaddressed. National Human Rights Commission, national, not just Punjab, has so many cases pending as to what happened with the Sikhs in Punjab. The Rajya Sabha members are non-Sikh ones. I.K. Gujral's son has stood there in the parliament and said, how come we don't know more about June 84, the attack when it happened on Darbar sub-complex? Six have been talking about it. Why is government not coming up and saying what really happened? So grievances have to do with, you know, Punjab issues, riparian water issues. Um, they show up in the news with a very different tint, but they are pending. There's whole 84 things when attack happened. Sure, there are people who disagreed with it, but you know, one is a state's responsibility. So is, is the community expecting an official apology from the government? There have been apologies, but I have my own take and community has never accepted them, by the way, because they are, <sighs> you Google today, what is a genuine apology? That has never happened. There are issues. There are people on national political scene even today who have been cited by non sikhs as directing the violence. Again, we are not saying, Suli pe chadado. We're saying, come on, you know, it's on your face right now. And this is from a community, you know, who has been called Gaddar so many times, you know. Dude, <laughs> we, Sikhs have done everything for yeah, India. We, Sikhs we, don't we, hate India. This is a wrong India. narrative. We wouldn't have India if it wasn't for Sikhs, honestly. Be, uh, you know who said that? A Muslim writer has written that, not even a Hindu writer. His name is Allah Yar Khan Yogi. I want to give you the direct line. I went to locate him, his descendants in Lahore. He wrote that. He wrote it in the context of because Guru Gobind Singh fought with the atrocities of some Muslims who were converting India forcefully, right? So this is not anti-Muslim sentiment because a Muslim guy wrote himself. He and he in praise of Guru Gobind Singh and he writes that Agar na hote Gobind Singh sunnat hoti sabki. It's Allah Yar Khan Yogi writing it. In a, on a long poem called Shahidane Wafa. So, you know, what we have done is we have made it about Hindu Muslim or a Mughal or a Hindu Hill Chief Rajas. It's nothing like that. That's when you create an oversimplification because you don't want to deal with issues. So it's called diversions, right? I mean, and kindergarten teachers do this all the time. When you don't want to engage with something, you divert their attention towards something else. That's what we keep doing. So Sikh community has legitimate grievances. In fact, Ambassador Casey Singh, uh, though you know people may know him, he's a former ambassador. He wrote a column on this. He's like, Indian External Affairs Ministry keeps saying Khalistan word on certain conversation. Diaspora Sikhs are doing this. Okay, they're doing whatever they're doing. What have we done to repair? That's the question at a state level, right? There always will be varieties of opinion on everything. What I do wish to say is that I know 200% that at least people my age and younger and maybe a little older as well. I'm 93 born. So I would go up to like people born in the 80s and 90s. There's a very deep sense of gratitude towards the Sikh community. Yeah. Especially when you talk about urban centers. Yeah. I can't speak for small town India because I'm not from small town India. No, there is. There is I, that's where our conversation started. I actually saw that in the last two years more. If I may say this, I'm a very avid reader and uh, I observe a lot. I, I read a lot, I watch a lot, even the things I don't like, because you know you have to see where the conversations are taking place. I can tell you, 
Nothing Sikh community did as a PR or as a work with the government changed the image of the Sikhs since 84. Nothing did. And you, I don't know if you know, the government in 84 had hired a company to do a negative campaign on Sikhs globally. It's called Rediffusion, which became Red If Mail eventually. Yes, it was from Bombay. I'm very aware of it. I have those documents which I have seen. As in the same company became Rediff. Yeah, Red If Mail eventually. Like Rediff.com. Yeah, but it used to be Rediffusion. That level of campaign was run against the six. Okay. Six have been trying, right? In multiple ways. Nothing was working. You know what changed? No Sikh political party did anything. No Sikh organization did anything. The individual response in last two years, average Indian thinks that no Sikh is okay. There was no leadership in farmers' protests and stuff, right? Take the politics aside for that. I'm just talking about image. Actually, image in India changed for the first time since 84 because what India saw on average Sikh. And the Indians said, whatever the politics might be, that aside. So, and that's the Sikh story, by the way. That's why I'm mentioning it. Sikhs never used to talk about what they do and who they are. We just did it. Others talked about it. That's part of the humility culture, which was presented from Guru Nanak onward. No, we're not going to talk about our own story. What do you think was about the narrative now as a Sikh? I have trouble with it. I have trouble with the narrative from the Sikh community. Now we tell the world who Sikhs are. That's why if you notice when you ask me, I try to go back to the Gurus or the Gurbani. Our job is to become a lover. A warrior who is a lover as well, right? Just to call us warriors is very problematic. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> One of the most famous images of Sikhs in the post-Guru period is Baba Deep Singh headless warrior fighting to defend Golden Temple Complex. Now, what people don't know, he did that at the age of 82. From 24 to 82, he's a scholar. At the age of 24, he comes to meet Guru Gobind Singh. He gets trained by him. He becomes a scribe. He's interpreting the text. He becomes not just the primary text, but the secondary text. But he's equally prepared to fight, and the world had never seen a scholar can fight like this. But look what Sikh narrative has done. They made him just a, fight, a warrior. No, we are not warriors. We are poets, we are lovers who can also fight. So the Sikh narrative really is, I don't decide what I will do. This is based out of Gurbani, right? Guru Granth Sahib. Uh, my work is, I should, <laughs> this, there's, a, there's a professor, Puran Singh writer, he writes this in English, so I'll just quote him. He says, you know, when I was not in love, I thought I was in love with the divine, I was very active. But now I've actually gone deeper in myself. What I realize is I don't get to decide how to serve the community. I need to be prepared to play the reed, flute, or to pick up the sword, whatever is needed. That's the Sikh narrative. And Sikhs did this. A ragi would fight. People hadn't seen that. A musician will fight. Our scholars used to fight because the world hadn't seen it. And they're like, how is this possible? Because we were inspired by that Shabbat, that Gyan Khadag. Gyan and Khadag are not separate things for Sikhs. In our DNA from Guru Nanak onwards, they're together. And when Sikhs are separating it themselves, you'll see that's why there is a disharmony within the community as well. Do you want to talk a little bit about where the warrior culture began? It's a myth, partly. You know, part of the Indian narrative is that myth. I think it suits particular ideology. I, I can share the phrase with you if but you want to talk about it. Don't you think it's a good... No. Like, what is wrong with being a warrior? Nothing. But we are not just warriors. I just said that. Okay, it's like... I, I think We the... have our own just war theory. It's Guru Gobind Singh who wrote it. This will shock you again. You know, I'm interested in what he writes. Because everything else is spinning, you know, mm. or my understanding. He says, he writes to Aurangzeb. Guru Gobind Singh wrote a letter to Aurangzeb. It has two copies of it. One is in Aurangabad, where the copy was made. And he, uh, Pahidaya Singh, one of the five original six Panjpiare, as we call them, he took it to Aurangzeb. Yeah. There's a quote in there. He's like, we will try every other method. And after exhausting it, we'll pick up the sword. 
Now it's Guru Gobind Singh writing, this is our just war theory. And the reason I'm saying this, in Christianity is the first religion which came up with the just war theory, which never happened during the Jesus time. Saint Augustine did that after hundreds of years. But here Guru Gobind Singh is telling us, and what did he base it on? Because gurus lived like that. That's why Guru Nanak didn't fight with the sword, because we believe we're gonna try everything else. By the time Guru Arjan came, Guru Nanak was imprisoned, as I mentioned to you. Guru Arjan is imprisoned and tortured now. Uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur, a political assassination attempts. A guy named Shiha was hired to assassinate him. Eventually, he's martyred in Delhi. Guru Gobind Singh is fighting in battles. He's also target of political assassination. This is pretty bloody, right? But even then, when he writes this, because it's been demonstrated that we can take everything, but don't believe that, don't think we can't fight back. We will fight. This happened in 20th century. I, I want you to know this under the British too. You know, those Gurdwara reform thing I was talking about, freeing the Gurdwaras? There were Akalis. Akalis is not a party. I know it's a political party today. Akali meant active six. Akali, Kali, which means beyond death. The ones who have married the death, which means they are not afraid. It's okay if they die. When they went to free the Gurdwaras, and there's a Morsha, uh, Jatoda Morsha it's called, there are pictures and the evidences for this. C.F. Andrews has written long articles on it. He says, you know, the, the day they would do Ardas, that today we are not fighting back. That's the day policemen under the British beat them to death. And they did that for days. Because six Ardas is very big. When we do collective prayer, we're supposed to stand by whatever we have said. And this is throughout our history, including when, what happened in the Warsaw complex. That's why they don't leave. Because they did an Ardas, we will die fighting today. That happened in 20th century early. Akalis did this. But the day that happened for like two months like that, and then one day they didn't ardas, today we are coming back with swords. That's the day we got the Nankana Sahib back. So I like to say, to present it, you know, there's a non-violence of the weak, and there's a non-violence of the strong. <laughs> we are the non-violence of the strong. We can, we can kick your ass, yeah. but we're gonna do that as a last thing. Yeah. Don't think that I'm not capable. I'm fully trained. I'm going to restrain myself because I believe in exhausting all means. Do no harm, take no shit. Something like that. <laughs> uh, that's uh, one contemporary way to say it and makes a nice t-shirt slogan. <laughs> um, coming back to the question I asked you though about the warrior culture thing. Mm. I think maybe that angle has possibly been used as negative PR for the community saying that, oh, these people are angry. Yeah. They're like warriors. And that's what the Sikh community is pissed off about. Listen, no, we're not angry people. <laughs> it's actually this spiritual warrior mentality. Yeah. Am I right? In yeah. Sense? Okay. But uh, I think let's build on it because it's not clear. Hua abhi, na? Um, build on it through the story, sir. Sure. Because again, teenagers watching this and yeah. I can go with I you know. at like really high levels, but let's go to the core of the human. Okay. So, you know, the most popular image of the six these days for last several years has been when you see Nihangs, for example, very colorful, and you got this warrior image, you know, you see Kirpans and the Khandas, right? And that's the thing, that they are the warriors tradition of the six. I want to step back a thing and tell you a little story. So there's a ninth guru. We have talked about some of the gurus. I'm going to come to the ninth guru. There's a ninth guru. His name is Guru Tegh Bahadur. He's politically beheaded in Delhi in 1675. 76 maybe, okay? For political reasons. What happens in the narrative is, we don't tell what happens after that. We do tell this, that this happened, Aurangzeb had ordered it. But what happened after that? It's not that all of a sudden warrior class started. We actually fought battles before that too. Sixth Guru fought four battles, including three against Jahangir. Guru Gobind Singh fought 21 battles. Only three were against Mughals. Yes, 19 were against Hindu Hill Chief, Hill, Hill Chief Rajas. Really? People don't know the realities. So I want to talk about how this warrior myth came, right? It is a myth. So Guru Tegh Bahadur is assassinated, literally. We call it martyrdom, but politically it's assassination. Order to death, just like you see in Middle East even now. Public beheadings. And then there is 1699, so almost 23 years of period where before Guru Gobind Singh brings out the Khalsa, as we say, as a warrior image. Again, it's skewed. It's not just warrior. But I want to talk about what did he do in those 23 years? 
And people don't talk about that. And I want to talk about it. He's like, we need training. The next levels of training. He did poetry uh, in Anandpur Sahib and Ponda Sahib, which is now in Himachal in multiple places. Let's train ourselves in how to be great poet. That's why he had 52 poets in his court. And the foremost among them was Pai Nandalal Goya, who used to write poetry in Agra. He's from Afghanistan, today's Afghanistan, but he had a desire to go serve as a poet in the court of Guru Gobind Singh in Anandpur Sahib. He says, so there's a poetry training. There is battle training. It's called Holla Mahalla, which is coming up as well, which means how do you fight mock battles? Yeah, that's the warrior part. But I want to tell you what, there's a scribing training. What do you mean, how do you fight mock battles? So how do you fight battles? So there are mock battles for it. No, we call okay. them trainings these days. Okay, okay. Exercises. Got it. So Holla Mahalla, from a holy, it became Holla Mahalla. Holla Mahalla is the attack. How do you prepare to attack? That's the tradition which is even today celebrated in Anandpur Sahib. So when you see those kripans and the colors and the large turbans and the chakkars on the head, that's one element. I want to tell you five other elements. So there's a training of poetry. There's a training of music. How do you sing? He's doing that too. And he's also doing trainings on how do you fight. But I'm going to use the word fight to describe something now, which is why I have issue with just calling ourselves. Look, Sikhs are being presented even by Sikhs themselves, not as warriors only. They've actually become fighters. And there's a big ish difference between a fighter and a warrior. Warrior is trained not to fight. Fighter is always fighting. Warrior is very settled. Warrior has, as we will call today, a loaded Glock, but not shooting. They're not trigger happy. But they know, they're trained not to use it. That's how you have to think for warriors. They have a code. And the adversary also respects that code because they know this is not a fighter. He actually is a warrior. That's what sex were. Our narrative has been changed. Some Sikhs have themselves changed the narrative. They present themselves as fighters now. We are not. Today we have garbs which define sons. It's the behavior. Your demonstration in life defines if you're a sant or not. Living the truth, truth exemplar. So that's the sant part. Sipahi is a soldier part. The one who's trained in first tradition. And then it's a hyphenated word, which means they're equally balanced. It's like a ship. Why do you have the equalizing bars? Because if either side gets heavy, you're drowning. That's the Sikh training. The spiritual political is equal. One or the other cannot dominate and that's imbalance. And then you will drown. Yeah. Um, while I thought that we'll go in chronological order, sir, this is why podcasts are podcasts. Uh, we can go tangentially. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Guru Gobind Singh Ji. 23 years he spent basically coaching an army but coaching six okay all six not army and this is the myth which i have to keep bursting bar war na? he's coaching six it's a preparation of a khalsa because khalsa otherwise becomes very androcentric image i'm using that word intentionally you mean even women were a part of it absolutely you're living in a culture where you don't get their story because that's why I play with the word history because her story is not even included. And Sikhs are not immune from it either. Although we are fighting that battle internally and gurus are training, but human beings are human beings. They're not including her stories. You know, if I were to tell you that in 1890s, a Sikh woman general defeated the Marathas, it will shock you. But she did. Her name was Rajkumari Sahib Kaur of Patiala. They were always trained. We, but we live in a culture, right? There are, the larger culture around you always influences you unless you are vigilant about your own belief systems. And that happens. I live in America. The American culture is influencing me. You can't escape it. But I must know what I believe in and what are my wisdoms, you know? So just like in India, you cannot say Sikh values are Indian values. In America, I cannot say Sikh values are American values. There'll be a misnomer. Sikh values are Sikh values. We integrate with them with the nationalities we live in, right? So this is the same way Guru Gobind Singh is revealing the Khalsa. He never said, I made the Khalsa. The original writing says, Prakateo Khalsa Paramatam Ki Maj. The Khalsa is revealed in the ecstasy of the divine, 
which means it was under training. People didn't see it. He brought them out on the Vasakhi day. So the training is of the six who want to live this lifestyle. It is the order of the Khalsa. Six are a large tent. There are 30 million six in the world. Not every Sikh is a Khalsa, but they aspire to become the Khalsa. Khalsa is the one, if I may use this phrase, they're the civil servants of the Panth. <laughs> Their aptitude, they have decided, needs to be spent on making sure the traditions of the Sikhs are kept alive as Guru Gobind Singh and Guru Nanak have developed them. So that's what Guru Gobind Singh did. You know, um, <laughs> The biggest thing people are aware of now is regarding his four sons, right? They died in battle. Two were bricked alive. No remorse. What is it? So which warrior will accept that? That's why we are not just warriors. Your internal has to be so centered. That's the meditation for six, if I may come back to it. That's our Simran. That's, Simran literally is remembrance. We live in the remembrance of the one. We are the lovers. Panj Pyare, people now use different words. Literally, it means five lovers. So if you see a male chauvinistic, androcentric warrior, something ain't right with it. I mean, how can you be anti-women? You must embrace feminism as well. You must embrace what we today call LGBTQIA plus issues. Right? That's what that means. Because we always did that. Anyone who is considered downtrodden, this is the vocabulary of Guru Granth Sahib, ki nichi hu at nich, the lowest of the low. Guru Nanak writes this in Guru Granth Sahib. He says, I identify with them. I'm not here to emulate the establishment. That's the Sikh DNA. He says, I'm not here to emulate the established. They already got the privilege. And you know, he ends that line. I want to share that because people have their own idea of grace these days. It has become very hocus pocus spiritual. He says, No, you want to feel the grace? Take care of the downtrodden. Jithe nich samalian, nadar teri bakshish. I receive your grace when I take care of unrepresented and underrepresented peoples, nations, and causes. And that's the Sikh history. That's our narrative. That's the Guru's narrative in Guru Granth Sahib. That's her Shabbat, that's her paradigm. Guru Gobind Singh did it, Guru Nanak did it. Six of the Guru continue to do it. We struggle with it, but that's, so, <laughs> that's, that's what Guru Gobind Singh gave us. What do you mean we struggle with it? Because we don't have our narrative right, right? We don't read the Shabbat anymore. Now we listen to more podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> We're part of the problem? <laughs> You can be, or you can be part of solutions. You're allowing me to share the narrative, which is not Harinder's story. So I worry about this stories a lot, right? Let me actually share with you this on my care. There is a litmus test in Guru Granth Sahib, which story to share. That's how I'm being careful. Which is what? The line is, Babaniya Kahaniya. Baba is the wise one, literally. Which story of the wise one are you going to share? Because there are way too many. It's a battle of narratives. That's what we say today, right? It's always been the battle of narratives. Which version will Sikhs present? The one Aurangzeb wrote or the one Guru Gobind Singh wrote? Similarly, it's today. Which version? So it tells us, it instructs the Sikhs which version. It says, Babaniya Kahaniya Put Saput Karen. The one, the narratives of the elders, the wise ones, which have the ability to transform an average child into a progeny. So I need to do my work with story I share. Does it have a transformation ability or is it just a feel good exercise? That's why I'm picking my narratives carefully. Okay. Grateful to you that you're doing it on the show. I say that again. Um, I want to bring in historical context again because. I've learned that while you're learning about Sikhi, historical context is so important mm. because of the political DNA. Let's go, go back to... Uh, and let's do it in the case of Guru Gobind Singh. This will be very interesting. Sure. Okay. Um, maybe give us a bit. I know you can't go over the whole thing, but give us a bit of the story of Guru Gobind Singh. Story of Guru Gobind Singh, even Sikhs are not ready for. We actually don't know Guru Gobind Singh is what I say to Sikhs. What do we know about him? You know, if I say to you he was a Bihari, most people will be like, what? 
he is a bihari he is not punjabi he is born in patna patna is the first what i call diaspora sikh center guru tegh bahadur picked that place you know why he picked it because punjab and amritsar he has written this in his hukumnama guru tegh bahadur his father <laughs> that we cannot tell who is collaborating with the state and who is working with the guru it's so political as in even the sikhs absolutely because it's human behavior right everyone is not trained to do the right thing and even the ones who are trained are not able to do the right thing that's a reality that's a human issue me guru gobind singh is born in patna i relate to that a lot because guru gobind singh has his own journey to anandpur sahib which is punjab where the khalsa was inaugurated and he's traveling through what we now call the central sort of a civilization there's a ganges valley civilization and there's a indus valley civilization the context of guru gobind singh is ganges valley civilization he writes about that i have read that it's powerful stuff guru guru nanak when we started we said it was there's a hindu and muslim confrontation of a sort you know where guru gobind singh is born it's jain and buddhist where the renaissance center is which university what's the one in bihar nalanda nalanda hour and a half from where buddha had his nirvana and two hours from where mahavir had his nirvana it's in that context so his vocabulary is rich with indologies it's a different civilization he talks about what is happening when he's traveling from bihar to anandpur sahib he records them he talks about this idea of understanding what vaishnavite tradition is what yogi tradition is how it has become part of the popular culture and what does it mean for him to exercise this in his capacities his conversations with the hindus the ranis and the kings of bihar that's guru gobind singh which we don't hear about so i'll just mention and when he has this travel he's five yeah obviously he's extraordinary that's what we're talking about him he's observing what he's seeing when he's traveling but he does not react to everything today i tell six why do we react to everything which means we are not secure anymore you witness so many things in life but you pick your battle and i end up saying guru gobind singh picked two battles we're going to do internal house cleaning and we're going to fight for external justice just to put in today's vocabulary so internal house cleaning he did was let's clean up the corrupt sikh governance that's what he did you know he never went to amritsar it had become so corrupt it's a sick center we have lot of learnings from guru gobind singh which we don't frequently talk about he never it was so corrupt he's like let's do internal house cleaning our governance got corrupt second thing it was let's take on the political affairs all the hill chiefs there are 22 hindu hill raja chiefs those 23 years i talked about 17 18 battles he's fighting with them only one is an ally of guru gobind singh raja of nahan rest they change their allegiances depending on once they are with aurangzeb sometimes they are not that's the richness of guru gobind singh diplomatic affairs fightings writing the literature getting the indologies translated in punjabi and then creating his own larger volume of work with these collections with his court poets called vidya sagar granth or what i need you to share with you is all that happened but there came a point in his life when they're crossing a river this is very big in sikh history and punjab's history this river is called sarsa and it's called sarsa da vichoda separation at sarsa he gets separated from his family he loses these assets he never documents that the most famous lines of guru gobind singh which the world knows which the bollywood knows is mitr pyare nu hal murida da kehna he says even with all that gone the only conversation he has is to my beloved friend i just want you to know the condition of the disciples he does not invoke his family he does not invoke um the literary knowledge is he does not invoke losing anandpur sahib because in sik parlance of guru granth sahib nothing matters what matters most is my relationship with the divine 
That's Guru Gobind Singh. That's the real Guru Gobind Singh in documented history. Um, again, many tangential questions here, sir. <laughs> Sorry, I'm constantly... No, no, no don't apologize. Prodding. Um, what was happening in Hindustan at this point? Mm. I think this is very important context for people to just understand because the Indian internet has now understood Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj well. Uh, and generally, even though I think there was a phase where the Marathas and Sikhs were warring, yeah. there's a lot of mutual respect from the there two is. communities. Yes. Uh, I would also put Rajputs in that same yeah. bracket. Uh, but what was happening historically? Yeah, the, 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 the conquest uh, essentially which was happening in India at the time of Guru Gobind Singh, it starts when I started talking about Guru Tegh Bahadur, right? Like what is happening in Punjab, what is happening in Bihar, within the community, but there's what is happening in South Asia. Maybe, maybe we could actually again bring in Babur. So okay. Babur was a contemporary okay. to Guru Nanak. And as the yeah. Mughal dynasty progresses, so does Sikhism. Yeah. Uh, and you said that um, hmm. the fifth Guru onwards, there was even a lot of battles with Hindu kings as well. Yeah. Both. That's, yeah. So let's ask me a question and I'll respond to that. Why, why don't you kind of give not just the historical context of Guru Gobind Singh Ji, but the entire historical context of Sikhism yeah. after Guru Nanak. So, you know, the one way to understand, chronologically speaking, the Sikh journey, especially in the Guru period, that you're dealing with 1469 to 1708, 239 years. I like to present it as being it's 239 years of training and 10 founder gurus. So we've talked about what happened in Punjab, how are they training the Sikhs and how it's not just the Sikhs, but Hindus and Muslims and tribals and Jains and others coming for similar things and many developing affinities without changing their religion because it's an allyship which gets created. That allyship gets played out in the larger political con context of South Asia as well. I'm using South Asia because it includes seven countries now, modern states, right? So that, what is that con uh, context? What is happening in India? There's a consolidation under the Mughal Empire. What people don't know is there is a Mughal, Babarke, it's called in Sikh narrative, and there is Babbeke. Every Sikh guru had particular relationship with every Mughal emperor. Sometimes friendship, sometimes antagonism, because we believe there is no permanent reliance. That's the Sikh narrative, by the way. In Guru Granth Sahib, it says, Hamra tada ham har kiya, that our alliance is only with the divine. Rest depends on what is the project we call it today. So every so that's why it's a very tense relationship with Jahangir. It's a very tense relationship with Aurangzeb. But I'll pick on Jahangir for a second, you know, because he's doing all sorts of things. It's a Mughal empire, all sorts of things are going on. The way they deal with Rajasthan, with the Rajputs is different than how they deal with Ahoms in Assam. And by the way, Guru Tegh Bahadur was asked by the Rajput Rajasthani king help. He sought Guru Tegh Bahadur's help to fight the Ahom dynasty of Assam. Guru Tegh Bahadur went there. I just went there to check this place out. I've been reading about it. And Guru Tegh Bahadur goes there. He's like, no, let's figure out how to create a treaty between the two of you. So gurus have played that role. People don't even know. Treaty between the Ahom king and the Aurangzeb subordinate uh, king uh, from here, who was a Hindu Raja. In some cases, Aurangzeb's um, prince, you know, uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur helped as well. In other cases, they had direct confrontation, like a physical battle even. Uh, Bahadur Shah Zafar comes after, not Zafar, just Bahadur Shah, sorry. After Aurangzeb dies, Guru Gobind Singh comes to see him on his way before he goes to Deccan in Agra. What I'm trying to say is, there is a state relationship with the gurus. None of the gurus, and this is the exception, and this will also tell you about Sikh DNA, why certain Sikhs don't do this even today. None of the gurus appear in the court of the Mughals. They get summoned. They send their ambassador or emissary, including his son one time, who changed the narrative of the Sikhs. Guru said, don't come back because you were not sent here to represent and get afraid. 
So this is a very tense relationship. We call it diplomatic missions today. In short, what was the story? Or what? The story is that there is a there is a hymn. You will call it. There is a sabad in Asa ki var Guru Nanak's bani, where it says, "Mitti Musalman ki pede pay komiyar." It's uh, Ram Rai is the son of Har Rai, the seventh guru, who had twenty two hundred horsemen with him, as well as set up the animal sanctuary in Punjab. It's that guru. He sends his son. He's like, okay, he's someone that you're writing something against Muslims. He comes to the court of Aurangzeb. He gets too afraid. He's although his guru's son, but you know, you can imagine it's like showing up in Supreme Court and you don't know what to say. You don't have the training. Now you have lawyers training you, right? And he changes the word to Bayman. The news spreads, and his father, as well as his guru, says, "No, you're my son, but nobody has right to even orally change what's written, Guru Granth Sahib." You must be able to explain it because we are not de- we are not dehumanizing anyone in there. It was actually using one of the metaphors uh, about the Muslim rights. Uh, uh, what happens? The the point is those kind of things were happening at the same time. Guru Gobind Singh's army. I'll use one example. You know, many a time they had very few six in his army. This people might not know. First battle Guru Gobind Singh fought. It's called Battle of Pangani. Three or four six were with him. Halwai went up. There was a Halwai of that area. He says, "I'll work with you." He's a Hindu guy. Seven hundred men of Buddhu Shah, Pir Buddhu Shah. He's called his people came, and one Odasi fought. They never fight. He's like every Odasi left, which are like a sadhus. You know, is one of the paramparas. They all left. They got so afraid that they might get killed in this battle. But their head stayed back. He's like. So this is what Guru does. He inspires all sorts of people from various backgrounds, six, non-six, Muslims, Hindus, Odasis, and they work with the Guru to fight on his behalf in the battle. What I'm trying to say is, uh, India has its own version of, you know, what happens with the Marathas, what happens with the Rajputs. The Sikh version is the creative excitement Guru's created. Many people worked with them. Some became six, but many didn't. Guru never asked him to become six. It was always a personal choice in Sikhi. This is why you will see many six are you know practitioners of the faith. Many aren't, and we don't have a dissonance like that. Many even leave the faith. We are okay with that. What is leaving the faith? Uh, not you know uh, looking like a six. Do you it, think that's truly leaving? Sorry. Do you think that is leaving the faith? No. It's presented as such. Look, leaving okay. the faith at the end of the day is not being a practitioner of the faith. But who decides that? At a personal level, it's only your decision. But there are community levels. When you are a representative in the community, then there are protocols you must adhere to. So that's a, it's at that level I was saying leaving the faith. Right? You cannot misrepresent the faith. You must adhere to normal protocols more than them because it's like being an ambassador. Ambassadors have to be held to different standards. So community does that. By the way, if an average person doesn't wear a turban or is not able to represent six, they don't go after them because it's a personal choice, and we value that. But if a leadership does that, then they take them to task. It doesn't matter who they are, including our kings, because now you are an ambassador and you are held to different standard. You have a public accountability. Mm. Okay. Um. Now I will let you continue what Guru Gobind Singh Ji said. The idea that each guru had state relationship is very important for us, because that's what we are taught that there must always be a dialogue with the state. Earlier state used to be imperialism, right? And we deal with this element even today. So when six having state relationship, what does it mean? Public dialogue, political dialogue. It continues into the British. and we don't have a monolith there either which we have to understand because now the guru is not there 18th century sikh history which i want to refer to a little bit what people don't know so what happens when guru gobind singh left this earth you can imagine when a prophet read i mean gurus are not prophets gurus are not avatars but i'm using that word just to explain the best period in sikh history is the 18th century it is the most bloody you know there were two genocidal campaigns where half of the sikh population was killed in one day and another one where two thirds of the sikh population was killed in one day but even then we fought ahmed shah abdali seven times 
These when he used to loot India and take women as slaves, we used to intercept them. The Sikhs used to intercept at this cost. And eventually what happens, and this is very, very important because a period came in Indian Punjab history, Indian history, South Asian history, but I'm going to call it Punjab history. Punjab was also ruled by invaders for 700 years. Obviously, India was too. In 1765, after the two major genocidal campaigns, Jassa Singh Aluwalia captures Lahore. So this idea of politically capturing power is very much part of Sikh tradition because they said, look, if nothing is working, if the ruler is so corrupt, we have to now capture Lahore and run it that way. It is 1765. It takes another 20 plus years before Ranjit Singh consolidates into a Punjab's empire. But that's the history. We actually did that in 18th century and people don't know this. Um, Amacha Abdali was an Afghan? He was an Afghan. He's, that's his common name. But actual name is Ahmad Shah Durrani. Okay. Same Pani Pat. Ahmad Same Shah. guy. Absolutely. Okay. Who's played by Sanjay Dutt in that movie. That's just... I'm not going to go into the Bollywood versions of these. Okay. Even Joe the Akbar, uh, there are issues with it. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. I Related mean, to six? No, no, six. Well, Akbar had a relationship with six, which I can get into, which are never talked about. Most of it is positive, but there is a non-positive part too. What is the non-positive? Because you see, what happens is there's a secularization of everything in the way we present in the Bollywood, Hollywood stories. But the other thing like Birbal. I grew up listening to Birbal. Birbal is considered Chutkale Wala, right? Mm. That's not the narrative. He is a, he's the only non-Muslim minister in his cabinet. His name is Mahesh Das Bhatt. He deputed to kill Guru Arjun. Really? Uh, this is going to shock you now. Because Guru Arjun refused to pay the tax. The taxation was for not practicing any other religion. And Guru Arjun has created such a big center. Think about this. For, that was Birbal is Mahesh Das Bhart who's coming to capture him. Really? Many people were sent to capture, including Birbal. There's Sulhi Khan, which is center, who was a, what today we will call a tax collector, or a revenue collector of Lahore was sent. Guru Arjan has written all this. He says, Sulhi de Narayan Rak. He's like, I've been taken care by Narayan. Who am I otherwise? And Narayan is not just a god Narayana in Hindu mythology. Narayan is an attribute of the divine. Narayan is Nar, iron, where you have stability in the water. Just think about that. How do you become stable in water? So Narayan is that ability of the individual when it is such a surface is so liquidy, volatile, you still remain stable. And that's the quality Guru Arjun invokes when people are being deputed to, be, to assassinate him. Guru Arjun was assassinated. He was captured. He was tortured for days. And this is a very interesting period in Sikh history. His body was never found. <laughs> you know, Punjab is all about rivers. So I'm going to invoke that little bit here. The Sikh narrative is that he uh, entered Ravi and he never came out. In fact, the Sikh narrative is even today he lives in Ravi. Rehende Guru Daryao, which Pai Gurdas has written this, which is the Sikh narrative, that Guru is still living in River Ravi. It's a pleasant way of saying, because what happened was he was tortured for several days. You know, we say he sat in a higher and played. There's a burning sand on him. And then, and by the way, Hindus, Muslims, his own family members, they're all collaborated with the state. His so own this, family members? Absolutely. His brother did. This is why it's never to, see, Sikhs are very clear. This is not about religion. This is about individuals who are power hungry, wants gifts from imperialism. They'll all do this. Doesn't matter what their religion is. It's a human tendency, right? Because you want to be sided with the power. Six have always been, like I said, no, it's okay. Even if my own brother is doing it, it is because it's not a brother thing. It's a human power hungry thing. Anyway, so Guru Arjun, they said, can you take a bath? And they're like, yeah, you should take a bath because when your body and you know, when your skin is coming off with the heat, they thought there'll be even more tortures when he goes in body in the, in the water of uh, river uh, in river Ravi and Guru Arjun enters that and never comes out. And this becomes part of the Sikh character. I want to share, that's why I'm sharing this. You'll notice this. This is very common understanding of Sikhs. 
Okay, you can kill them, you can torture them to death, but don't insult them. It comes from here. We don't take insult very well. Yeah. We'll take torture, we'll take death. Because our gurus taught us that. You don't want, you're not going to spit on us. You're not going to dehumanize us. Yes, you can torture us to death because guru teaches us that. We should have the ability. That's the Simran. The remembrance is so strong with the divine, with the one, that the physical body, we can live with the torture on that. But that remembrance must not break. Which is also why respect and love is greeted with 10x amount of respect and love. Something like that. Yeah. Actually, it becomes, you actually know what X it will be because it's dependent on how strong your relationship is. You know, today we, it's like entropy kind of thing going on. It could be 2X, it could be one and a half or 1,000X. It's the level of the strength and intimacy in the relationship with the divine. Yeah. Want to say something egoistic here? A little bit egoistic. I feel like aspects of Sikhism rub off on all Punjabis. There is an element of Sikhism in all Punjabis, which is why. In not it, you know, yes, I'm I'm gonna double down on that. What we don't realize is everyone in Punjab <laughs> got affected by this. Everyone, mm -hmm. even the jut of Punjab is different than the jats of other areas. Otherwise, I'm mean, just put it in perspective. You know how the creativism, the karta puruk idea gets into play. Otherwise, you know, jats are so-called quote unquote low caste, but they became rulers in Punjab. How come it didn't happen anywhere else in, in, mm -hmm. in India? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every community got uplifted because they all believed, you know, everyone used to read Jabji in Punjab. <laughs> Many still do. It is not a Sikh thing. For Sikhs, it might be part of religiosity. But for Punjabis, in fact, Professor Puran Singh was a writer. I like him because he was, you know, he was never published in India. That's why I quote him so much. There was a whole conspiracy to publish him. He wrote in English from 1910. Only in 1960s, he got published in Punjab. Everything got published in England. Because he was too explo he was telling the real narrative, not his story, but what the Guru's story is, what the Sikh story is. He's written that. He says, even the rivers of Punjab sing Jabji. Just think about that for a second. So Rabindranath Tagore says that. Osho says that. Whatever people may think of any of these personalities, the Sufis of Punjab say it. The Sufis of Punjab's vocabulary changed with the arrival of the Guru. This again will shock you. The first heer is not Varishas. That's the most popular one. The first heer is written by Damodar Gulati. He was a Sikh of the third Guru, Guru Amar Das. Because we actually embrace that love culture. The legendary love stories of Punjab are embraced by Sikhs. We wrote them. We wrote a version of them. And the first heer was written by a Sikh. It's also why the best love songs are always in Punjabi. <laughs> uh, it, now it's debatable whether they're love. But the point is, well, actually, let me differentiate since we are talking about this. Bhai Gurdas, who is actually a theologian, he talks about the love stories of Punjab. He mentions, so we embrace this, yeah? Like today's Sikh religiosity may not get this. They'll get afraid because I believe many of them are not Shabbat born. You know, many of them are just religion born right now. Pai Gurdas says, he, he references Heer Ranja. He references Laila Majnu, Soni Mahewal. Now, he does not reference Mirza Sahiba, which is a popular narrative today also, right? And I got curious. I didn't know about legendary love stories of Punjab. I'm, I may, you may think I'm Punjabi, but I'm not. <laughs> I, you know, as nerd as I am, in my college days, I picked up the legendary love stories of Punjab written by some you know, white woman, and I read it, I'm like, oh, that's why. Because in Mirza Saheva, it became about Devdas. It's about fight. Well, the popular song also says, Prava to yaar maradita, right? And you know, I notice this in today's culture. When I'm listening to Punjabi songs, I'm, I'm scanning through them. Very few are about Rahir Ranja now. They're more about Mirza Saheva. What does that tell you about today's culture? Because actually they are being Mirza Saheva. He, hmm. Ranja, will die, but will not live in separation. Mirza Saiba will get assassinations done. And that's what you're seeing these days. So, here is that protagonist 
who's questioning the family, the tribe, and the transactionization of women. <laughs> That's here. I don't think we get what here is. And she's a married woman. You know, it's a blasphemy in Islam for a married woman to go have a lover. But our theologian is saying, if you want to love the guru, learn it from her. This is the key. One thing I'm really enjoying about talking to you, sir, is like, we've covered so many different aspects of the subject over two episodes. Um, I have to cover a little bit about uh, Guru Gobind Singh Ji and his main contributions to Sikhi in general and touch upon Maharaja Ranjit Singh a little bit because it's another internet term that mm. comes up a lot. So uh, maybe again, starting from historical context, I'm sorry, I keep pulling you back to it, but it's the easiest way for listeners to connect. Uh, what happened in Guru Gobind Singh's life, like especially once the Khalsa actually began at the end of that 23 year period. So for 23 years, he's imparting different skills of which one is fighting to all six. What happens at the 23 year mark? So contrary to the popular belief, the battle started before Khalsa was inaugurated. Battle started much earlier, which means everything is happening. But now it's like a mentorship and apprenticeship. But Khalsa, what people don't realize it, Guru Gobind Singh called Khalsa to be his guru. This is disruption and flipping what is a norm in the world. Like if you are the guru, rest our shishya, right? If you are the mentor, rest our protege. On Khalsa day, he's saying, the training is so good that I submit to them now. Can you, I mean, this is, today we call, in a very business-like way, we call this a leader-servant model. Guru Gobind Singh lived it. He did it. You know, six call him the Shahanshah and the Padshah, you know, bigger than the Badshah because Badshah is only in the physical domain. Padshah is physical and metaphysical domain. Yeah. Guru Gobind Singh on Vasakhi day, people don't realize, inaugurated the Khalsa and then he sat on his knees that now make me part of the Khalsa. So humility in practice. And democratizing leadership, we call it today, representative democracy, that in training of 239 years is complete. The only consultancy you need is of Guru Granth Sahib. This is the vision, the principles, and the interpretation of that, the currents, how do you keep it contemporary decision-making has to come to the first principles distributed among five people. So that five is the idea of punch, which is an Indic tradition, but now he's doing it in practice. And since then, that's why we don't, anytime Sikh community goes through a single leadership, we actually, our downfall starts. A single leadership? Yeah, because Guru said, no, don't you have it anymore. Because single person is imperfect, regardless of their excellences, and they will falter. So he said, let's have five. And that's why in today's boards, they say you need odd numbers, whether it's the judges or the board directors, they say have five or have seven or have nine, right? So this idea of five is there very much. So Guru Gobind Singh did that. Sikh community from there onwards goes through 100 years of fighting invaders in the absence of Guru Gobind Singh because Guru Gobind Singh has said, let's go now actually create sea change. Enough is enough. Banda Singh Bahadur, people know about it maybe, maybe they don't. He's the one, in fact, my friend and I were at Harvard at some discussions several years ago, and the, one of the professors of South Asian history was sitting there and they start saying, what happened to Mughal dynasty? And my friend Harpreet, uh, who was doing PhD at the time at Harvard, he looked at me like, Harinder, you want to answer that? I said, yeah, Banda Singh Bahadur happened. We don't teach that. Banda Singh Bahadur literally demolished the Mughal Raj and he paid for it for his, with his life. You know, for seven years, he gave him havoc and he established what's called Khalsa rule. He established it in May 1710. And then eventually they got to him six years later and they brought him in a cage to Delhi and publicly assassinated 700 men they captured and in front of him, they tortured him by killing his son in front of him and shoving in his mouth. It's very gruesome and very bloody. And, and the reason I'm mentioning this is, people, you know, everyone knows Qutub Minar. Half a kilometer from Qutub Minar is a place called Katalga, 
where they did this to Banda Bahadur. Same Banda Bahadur, which Rabindranath Tagore writes a poem that Banda is his poem, that Bandi, I don't know if people have read this. What I'm saying is historians and poets are very aware of it, but they don't talk enough about it. Banda Singh Bahadur is the one who took care of the Mughal dynasty is one narrative, which is not highlighted enough. So Sikh history is something like that. You have 100 years of that and Ranjit Singh gets mentioned because Ranjit Singh consolidated the Sikh empire, we call it today. Sikhs have never been in majority. So this is a contemporary phenomenon too. I think it's important for people to know. You know, Ranjit Singh was invited to rule Lahore. 19 people wrote a letter. 19. He didn't fight to capture Lahore. Hindus and Muslims of Lahore leadership wrote a letter to him that the Sikhs who captured Lahore earlier, remember I said in 1760s, they were called the Pangi missiles. They were, they're like, we are inviting you to become our Maharaja because we need beggar help, better help. We need a better ruling. We need a better governance. So he's the one who created that empire, who ruled for 40 years, had five treaties with the British, with the Chinese, with the Tibetans. People don't know this part of history. He was the only indigenous ruler of South Asia. British never fought him. They feared him. The day he dies, Bohok and Crook, as they say, with assassinations, with buying people off, buying his generals, they finally annexed the Punjab in 1849. So, but Ranjit Singh is that, that who showed a model, you know, the France is considered the premier multicultural model, but in 10 years ago, it failed. They couldn't figure out how to deal with their African population who they thought they had integrated. Maharaj Ranjit Singh did it. No capital punishment during his Raj. He has Hindu officers, Muslim officers, man from Philadelphia serves in his army. <laughs> his general is one of them is a Frenchman called Ventura. So this is the thing he created, right? He equally gave money to run. Actually, I want to talk about education. There is a serious report on what was the educational system of Punjab at the time because British were trying to copy it, believe it or not. Ranjit Singh spent more per capita on education than the British Empire did in England. The system of education, he, really, he himself was not very well educated, but he was very well trained in Sikhi. He was a Khalsa. He had taken Amrit as well at a very young age. His uh, grandfather, Baba Chada Singh, was the one who had captured Kashmir, actually. People don't realize Kashmir was part of the Sikh Empire. So Ranjit Singh is that example of multiculturalism, which worked. Uh, he, he had no state religion. In fact, he did not even make Punjabi the state language. This may shock people. His state language remained, the lingua franca remained Farsi because that has been the tradition. So this is the secureness, right? Like he's sick, he's very clear. Everyone knows he's a sick, but the amount of money given to maintain Sikh places of learning and worship and Hindu places and Muslim places included, equally given grants to them. It was a, it was a huge model uh, and then people loved it. People of all denominations loved it. There is a question uh, that I've planned since before we even began speaking, which is the explanation of the 5Ks. I don't think this is available on the internet in the form that it should be available in. Like everyone knows what it is, but I'd like for you to give a little bit of the spiritual angle on it as well. Five Ks of the Khalsa cannot be explained with any utilitarian value. It never have, the, no explanation was provided by Guru Gobind Singh. I want to start there. So that's important, right? And this is the same reason none of the gurus also commissioned history. No biography was written by of any guru, they never commissioned it because for them, individuality is not important. The idea is important. So 5Ks, there is no utilitarian explanation. People try to give it, it's, it will never make sense. So what is said? What is said is, they are the gifts from the beloved. Now who finds the meaning in gifts? I can give you historical angle, but that's not important here. The gift's value is between the one who gives it and the one who receives it. The way ones who received it have explained it for themselves, this is how I identify with Guru Gobind Singh. Now, 
there is a kada, there is a kirpan, there is a kachara, there is case. I mean, and there's kanga. People can put values to it, but it's a wedding gift. I'm going to use that word. Because what the people who receive that, they're taking Amrit. Amrit is not just a spiritual ceremony. Amrit actually is an initiation ceremony. Amrit. Mrit is dead. Amrit makes it opposite, immortal, which means from here onwards, the value and the fear you have of your life is eliminated, which means I'm marrying the Guru. This is the spiritual mysticism. When you marry someone, you receive gifts. These are the gifts because I want to be like Guru Gobind Singh. And Guru Gobind Singh finds value in these. Just like within the Guru period, they gifted the Gyan and the Kharag. In the Khalsa period onwards, Guru Gobind Singh onwards, these are the gifts received and we cherish them. There are foreigners watching this also. Could you quickly explain the five Ks? The K, the word K became uh, known because in Punjabi or in local language of the time, the, all the letters, the names of the uh, each gift starts with the K sound or Ka sound. And that's why they're called five Ks. But I want to come back to it. Y you'll also have to just name them. Yeah. And, okay. and explain what it is. Oh, sure. And ideally what it stands for also. That will be utilitarianism. Okay, so okay. that'll be a problematic. Okay, but take, take sure. it as far as you can. So the five Ks are the day you get initiated, there is a whole ceremony. Ceremony has its own powerful purposes, but I was actually saying it is not just spiritual because what happens that day before your, what happens that day is you say your father is Guru Gobind Singh from here onwards. Your mother is Mata Sahib Kaur, one of the wives of Guru Gobind Singh, who was not his Conjugal wife, she's the mother of the Khalsa. And you belong to Anandpur from their day onwards, which means everyone knew. This is why there was a tradition in Punjab that even Hindu families will have one son who's a Sikh. Because they belong, this person is going to do the right thing. When the push comes to shove, they will go do whatever is necessary, including giving up their life. So that was the order of the Khalsa. That remains the order of the Khalsa. So it's a very political ceremony, you see. Everyone knew from that day onward, your family, the state, the protagonist, the antagonist, the adversaries, that this individual, man or a woman, they have married the guru. They are not afraid of anything. They will do the right thing at any cost. So one of the things there is you receive case, which means your hair. In fact, many people kept them beforehand, even before they went through ceremony, because they're preparing, right? You have to prepare to receive many things. So case is uncut hair. There are all sort of explanations in mysticism of the world religions. Something is there about the hair. Guru doesn't provide that, like you keep your hair. We don't cut it, that's why. And then we are not like Rastafarians or the Jogis. So you gotta keep them tidy, grooming we call it today. So the Kanga, the comb is there to keep it tidy. You know, so we wanna keep it clean because we want, that's why bathing cleaning is part of that tradition. Again, uh, Kanga is something very big. You know, when Guru Gobind Singh, for example, after a battle six world, including Muslims who were there, they'll say, can I have your case? Because in Islam, having a strand of hair of a prophet is considered the ultimate gift. So there's something with the hair, which is even in the Kanga. Uh, it's, a, it's a mysticism idea, which you find in mystical traditions globally. And then there is Kada. All sort of explanations are there, but it's a marker. Some, I, I've gone through many explanations, but nothing works. It's a bangle too. It's a hathkadi. Is it a bangle? I don't know. It's a reminder that I am of the guru. There's a kirpan. People have created all sorts of explanations. It's, of, it's a weapon, of offensive weapon, defensive weapon. Kirpan is kirpan. What is more important is he didn't call it sword. He didn't call it shamshir or talwar, which are the existing vocabularies. He called it kirpan, which I want to explain actually. Kirpa and An, the nerdiness, the etymology of the word is, Kirpa is grace, An is honor, something which is used gracefully to protect honor. This is why only warriors know what to do with Kirpa and the fighter will use it every single chance. No, you don't. You, you got to use it only to protect honor and not just yours, anyone's. Uh, and then kachara is undershorts, which is to do with, because you see in Indic traditions, there are many who actually get rid of all clothing. 
and their warriors, they will lay other clothing. The idea here was that you should have that on so you're always ready. The readiness was related to it. So you wear something. You don't stay naked and you are ever ready to just get on a battlefield without having to put on the whole armor as well. There are all sorts of explanations with it, but it's some undergarment is what it's saying. Not being naked. That's it. Those are the five Ks, but they're gifts from the Guru. And marrying the Guru <laughs> is actually a gesture. Which I personally, if I may say this, you know, because ceremonies are not powerful if you think about them. Right now we are thinking about them. Any ceremony becomes incredibly powerful when you think with them. So the ones who go through that process, only they know what it is. Just like a wedding. You, know, you can't ask a newly married woman, why is she wearing a particular shingar? If you ask for that analysis, she should slap you. <laughs> right? Because there is no analysis. The meaning is to be felt and experienced. And it's it between the lover and the beloved. And that's why we call our gurus the beloved Patsha. Satcha Patsha, the eternal Patsha. We call them the groom as well, because we become the women in that we take the feminine form, including men. This is very, very important. Because gurus present them themselves as feminine when they talk about the divine. It's not that because in the world, he is still being used to refine God. Gurus don't do that. We actually call it ajunni, which is the word I forgot to explain earlier. I even forgot to mention. It means beyond gender. Genderless. So gurus are going the other way to say, we got to carry that feminine angle with us. Because the patriarchy and purity are still a big problem. They were problem earlier, even 2023. Yeah. And they're confronting it head on. No, we got to get rid of this nonsense. Uh, because purity is in the mind, not in the bodily functions. Speaking about 2023 and um, confrontation generally, sir. It's a little raw question. So I, I hope it doesn't offend you. No, no, I'm not going to get offended. I have a pretty thick skin. No, no worries. I, I mean, <laughs> okay. This is something I always wondered being Punjabi. And I think this podcast is the right place to ask that question. And I've asked this question to a lot of military folks as well. Why do Sikh people actually make great soldiers to the degree where you have an empire like the Sikh empire, where you have so many Sikhs in the Militaries of the globe generally now. That's right. Not just the Indian military. Yeah. Uh, where does that warrior element, soldier element come from? Though I know you've answered a part of it, but there's got to be something. What makes six great warriors? Yeah. Is it the size and strength of being Punjabi? <laughs> or is it like something else, according to you? So we have to deconstruct a couple of things here. Because that's how stereotypes get built. Sure. Stereotypes always have an element of truth, but we oversimplify them and it becomes mythical then. And they're problematic then. Look, first of all, Sikhs are not one ethnicity. All Sikhs are not Juts, for example. So we got to relax it on. We never say that Sikhs also make great writers. Because there are several. So. What has happened in the Punjabi context is there are two traditional occupations. When we talk about economies of the world, especially, what are the two traditional things? It's farming and it's soldier. So when it was farming and soldier, that's what you see most Sikhs and Punjabis doing. Mm. When the economies are changing, Sikhs start doing other things too. I mean, we are in various forms now, parts of heads of departments, parts of musical culture in the film industry, many were not accepted. So they changed their names. I don't know if you know that. Many are Sikhs. Gulzar is a Sikh. People don't know this. Really? Yes. You should read his story. He writes about it. He talks about it because he was not being accepted as a Sikh. Yes. So we have, when I say nation building is needed, there are elements. Wow. There are elements. Would you name anyone else? That well, I just named one because he has come out. It's not my place. Let people tell on their own because I have to respect their confidences. He is, he's mentioned it. 
there are lots of people who've not come out about. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that, right? So many things have happened in last hundred years as well. So my point is, we are not saying that they are great businessmen. You know, Delhi, the new Delhi, seven contractors, four or six. We never say they're great contractors. You should, so next time you go to Delhi, drive by the Rashpavi Bhavan, there's a plaque there, you should see four names or six. Essentially, if I may come to the spirit of your question, six are not risk averse people. Whatever is risky, we do it because faith and risk are directly proportional. Mm. We are people of faith. Jo illegal, huh? things which are not being done. We used to be trendsetters. We still are like that to some extent, but not to large extent. And that's our kind of internal struggle going on. But we have always done that. Uh, I, I, as I said, you know, venturing out to foreign countries was a tough thing. Six did it in early days. Now everyone gets people like me get on, you know, triple sevens and dreamliners to get there quickly. Earlier, it was a journey. It was a task. It was, you're not sure if you're going to get there, right? So that's what six are. That's the DNA. We are not risk averse. It's not profession of army. It was a traditional profession. So a defense minister of Canada is a Sikh. He's a good friend of mine. But we don't say, what about other Sikhs? There are 19 other MPs as well who are Sikhs. <laughs> what about all the heads of departments who have become Sikhs? It's just, you know, what we end up highlighting and that's what stereotyping becomes, which is problematic. So we Sikhs are all, we are warriors as well is what I say. I don't run away from it. Just like if you say Guru Gobind Singh is a warrior, that's making him too small. Go the on. phrase on Guru Gobind Singh is Bad Shah Darvesh. We have forgotten the Darvesh part. He's a hyphenation of what the world calls saintly people and soldier people. It's Bad Shah Darvesh. He's a prophet emperor. Yeah. So let's not forget the prophetic part. Yeah. Arindar Singh, sir. This is the end of the episodes. <laughs> How was it for you? Well, it's an interesting journey. It's a different journey. Okay. Uh, I, what, what I've liked so far is, actually all of it, it's pretty real. And I appreciate that. Um, mostly people have manufactured questions. <laughs> I think you're exploring and I appreciate that you're venturing into no, no, I can't claim what is the Sikh narrative, but you are venturing into in the vicinity of the Sikh narratives, yeah. which is what I try to share. That's all you can do. The one thing that I've realized is that in modern times, there's way too many narratives about the same thing out there. All you can do is get closer and closer to the truth through questions. Yes. For me, this uh, was effectively the first conversation on Sikhi that I've had. And there's going to be more. I've done an incredible one with... Uh, uh, Satpal Bhai from Nanak Nam, uh, but that was again more in a spiritual context. This is a uh, real Indian history, which is again the core principle of this show. So I thank you on behalf of the entire audience as well, sir. Thanks for teaching us so much. Uh, and what I will say is that uh, people like you need to come out more on the internet and teach an entire generation about everything that you've studied in your life. Like the th stuff that took you decades to learn we very greedily want to take from you in a few hours. So I urge you to be on more podcasts and come back on the show because you've had a crazy life as well outside of your <laughs> learnings about Sikhi. So well, as this inshallah, let's see what's possible. But I'm not a teacher. I am very clear. I'm uh, what I've shared with you and what your audience will hear. It's I'm retelling. I'm trying to retell it from the source as I understand it but I'm trying to base it on the source of truth in Sikhi rather than my gut feelings or half-baked emotions. Because I think those are important, but those are not Sikh narrative. That will become Harinder's narrative then. Mm. And I think today we were trying to do a bit more on Sikh narrative. I, I added my narrative in few places where it was personal, but largely it is about Sikh narrative, which is really about South Asian history. Uh, which got globalized. Yes, so again, just very grateful towards you. And I'm hoping to speak to you again. That's what I will say, sir. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you, sir. That was the episode for today. My producer, Shrutesh, watched this episode, reviewed it and said, this is a true podcast.
until this point in our podcasting journey we've had to cut episodes down to an hour sometimes down to 45 minutes just so that they consumed in the entirety but i feel with where podcasting is going in india you need extremely long in depth conversations just like this to be lapped up by the audiences i feel we're at the brink of true podcasting in india i'm glad to be one of the mediums to bring you true podcasting and i'm extremely glad to have spoken to harinder singh i do regret not doing this in hindi a little bit i feel like it could have spread out even more but we will do that very soon if you're sick watching this please tell me how i could have done a better job with this particular podcast if you're a non sikh watching this i hope you spread this as far and as wide as is possible this was the ranvi show follow us on spotify every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world and if you wish to support team beer biceps even more with our other endeavors our meditation app level supermind is now live on the app store and play store so begin your meditation journey grow your mind take your mind to deeper places within itself and grow along with us on t r s lots of love